Thanks for choosing this free Anfield Index podcast. If you'd prefer to listen to this or any of our other shows without adverts, then now's the time to check out Anfield Index Pro. With AI Pro, you can supercharge your entire listening experience. You'll not only get all of our podcasts without the ads, but you'll have them far faster with our quick publish feature available exclusively for subscribers. AI Pro also puts you in the heart of our sound studio with an option to listen to many of our shows live and interact with the podcasters in real time as the shows are recording. Upgrading couldn't be easier. AI Pro is available on all popular podcast platforms and we have our own apps for Apple and Android. Just head on over to AnfieldIndexPro.com and get started today. Podcasting to you from a field here in beautiful rural Ireland. I'm Trev Denny, and this is Malby on the Spot, your weekly chance, thanks to Anfield Index Pro, to hear the wit and wisdom of Liverpool and Denmark legend Jan Malby as we talk about all things Liverpool Football Club. So, for the first time in the summer and off season, let's begin. Good evening, Jan. Good evening, Trevor. I hope you've been. Uh, I hope you've been well. It's been a little while. It has been a while, man, and I'll tell you how sad it is. Uh, that in the period of time since we've done a show together, and I think that may only really be two and a bit weeks. In that period of time, um, things have changed so much that I've got. I've still got the title and synopsis from the last show on my notes here. Uh, and the title of that last show was The Dream is Alive. And we're looking back on the fact that we had two cups in the bag and the fact that we had a chance on the last day of the Premier League campaign to still get it over the line and we had the Champions League final ahead of us. Um, quite a lot has happened in that interim. Um, and we've also had some lovely things in terms of the celebrations via the, the parade, which I think even the most sort of grumpy old sods would have had to agree was was a, was a lovely thing, um, a very kind of important thing, I think, as well for the club, kind of for the players and, 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 and the fans and all that type of thing. But there's so much that we can sort of pull apart now with a little bit of distance gone. And w- just before the mics went live, I was saying to you that I didn't take that Champions League f- final defeat well at all. I, I, it's, it's a weird thing. I'm normally very really phlegmatic about stuff like that. I can just not necessarily immediately just say, oh, well, let's go again. We go again. I'm not really one of those guys. But, you know, you just put it in a box and you get on with it. I've been fucking furious about it since, man. I'm just, and I'll tell you why. Because for me, this team uh, and this period of uh, this era of the club, this iteration of the club under Jurgen Klopp, it needs to have the trophies uh, that they I honestly believe deserve and and the fact that neither of those two big ones came our way I don't care if it sounds uh, selfish or entitled that galls me it really does I wanted one of those two so badly um I wonder with the process of 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 the passing of time in a couple of weeks and a break away from football like I know you've had the same as me uh, how, how's it sitting with you? Are you are you a bit more easy going about it, or is it still sort of rankling? No, I I, I thought I got pretty well with it. I mean, obviously the Premier League, uh, the last day was a, was was a weird day. I was at Anfield commentating, and it was a difficult game to commentate on because of what was happening at the Etihad and the fact that we they weren't winning. We 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 were never winning the title either because you know we hadn't got our goals until late on. So it was kind of a bizarre afternoon. Uh, and and still on a, along the line, Trev, I guess, you know, Manchester City are tuna down twice in the last week and they pull it out of the bag and get enough points to win the league. So you kind of tip your cap to them and go, OK, well done. Uh, Champions League, I was in the studio in Copenhagen, which, you know, as soon as the game's finished, you know, although the majority of viewers will, will know that there's there's some bias from me, isn't it? But still you try and be, be neutral. So... You speak as much about Real Madrid as you speak about Liverpool, and you don't just look at at, at Liverpool's angle of, of not winning a trophy that they probably should have won because we are a better team than Real Madrid. That doesn't guarantee you're going to beat them. We are the best team than Real Madrid, and so so I kind of got over it in in, in in that way, and then I spent a few more days away, and my daughter's getting married in the summer, so we just had a stag weekend with a load of rugby fellas, so there wasn't a lot of football. <laughs> 
kind of kept that an arm's length forever. Yeah. <laughs> but, and until, until, so we're doing this show on a Thursday, uh, until Wednesday, uh, the 8th of June, when I woke up and the Darwin Nunez thing was was, was, was everywhere. So, and, and that's when you sort of kind of went, oh, well, okay, yeah, there's still things happening. Yeah, there's still things happening. And I, I, you know what? D- despite myself, I've been dragged back into that now as well. And I didn't want to be. And, and I, I just realized, you know, you you know, when you're when you're as obsessed with something as, as I am um, with the club, it's kind of it's impossible to take too long of a break. Really, you can talk big about about um, putting it to one side, but you can't really. And do you know do you know where I'm going with that point, though, about <clears throat> There was a lot of chat about, you know, is the season a failure? Can we consider the season a failure? And 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 an awful lot of that is obviously shit talk from opposing fans or people trying to stir the pot a bit. And there are two trophies that got won, and we saw some of the best football that we've seen um, in 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 our times uh, watching um, Liverpool teams. Um, so it's objectively a successful season to take it to the very last game um, in everything. Um, but I, I just have this knowing thing where I just, I really, really felt as if, and I feel as if the team that we've been talking about since we started doing this podcast, um, especially this current version of it, just deserved that a little bit more. They have that higher status. And it feels like a massive ask to say, we go again, that we'll do it again and we'll get straight back to the the, the Champions League and, 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 and this time we'll get it over the line. You know, it just seems like a massive ask. That one was there for us to win because, as you said, whether or not it's a, it sounds like a mad alternative universe thing to be saying, but we are objectively better than Real Madrid. I mean, that's quite a hell of a sentence, right? We are. And, and it just, it just feels like we left it behind us. And I wonder, you know, in your thinking about it since, is there a little bit of frustration there? Annoyance? I think I have a bit of annoyance about it. When I actually got away from the, all the bullshit that went on. Obviously, that was a huge story. We'll talk about that in a minute. And it's, it's ongoing. And uh, the lies that are being propagated there about the whole fan situation and the, the toggery from the um, French police. But we'll talk about that in a second. But as I've thought, as I've been thinking about the game, yeah, and that's what I, I have a little bit of an irritation that we just weren't at it the way that we should have been to get the freaking job done. Um, and that, that stings a bit, you know, that we couldn't manage to get a couple of goals you know we've we've always said that about this team look we'll just sort of, whatever happens at least we know we can score didn't happen and it just it, it's 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 been gnawing away at me and i'm wondering is is that the kind of thing that worries you going forward because especially now as we're going to start pulling the team apart a little bit i think what irritates you trevor uh i can't be 100 sure but but but, but i think you're put together a little bit like me what irritates you is the credit being given to the opposition when you sort of know that, ho, 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 that's not why they beat us. They beat yeah. us because we weren't at it. Or, I mean, did you see one of the early reports which people talk about, you know, Ancelotti's uh, basically giving Klopp a go and over, you know what I mean? Uh, giving him a schooling is, and you go, wow, 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 that, that's not what it was about, was it? It was about, and I think we played like that for a couple of weeks where the edge was just off our game. We, we, we were still energetic and whatever, but I think the heads had just got a little bit tired uh, and we just couldn't find the openings that we did earlier in the season. And I think that's the one thing, isn't it, where you go, all right, we well, did 1-1-0, fair enough, I can live with that. But let's not, let's not make up too many reasons why they beat us because they don't they don't hold true. You know what I mean? The main reason you have to look at is that that, that we weren't at our, at our best. Uh, and I have to say, I, I don't think they're much of a team, Trevor, you know what I mean, on, on most given days. Okay, would have been where we did probably seven out of ten, but we beat them seven times out of ten, isn't it? So I think that's the one thing that kind of grinds away a little bit at you. And you go, well, okay, just ask us to hold our hands up and go, we were in Liverpool today, but let's not give too many reasons why we did beat us because I, I can't recognise that, you know what I mean? And, and that was my big problem with it, isn't it? You know what I mean? Remember did A, B, and C, whatever. They might have stopped some of our better players, but they wouldn't have stopped some of our better players if I, those players would have been absolutely bang on their game, isn't it? And that's the one thing that maybe just annoys me a little. It really does. And 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 nowhere 
is the is that brought into sharper focus than looking at the form of our main man Mo uh, Salah, you know, over the last part of the season, and it started to become a bit of a bone of contention. Um, I noticed, um, and it started to become one of those things that was very divisive uh, amongst um, um, people who I could see talking about it. If you had the temerity to say that uh, he was well off uh, the type of, 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 of form that he was capable of, um, which we'd seen only, you know, months beforehand, it, it was a, a sort of a, a almost condescending response from some people saying, you know, hey, look, look at these figures, look at these stats and, you know, what do you want? And he's played more football than anybody else and blah, blah, blah. And yeah, I get that. I absolutely get that. All I'm just saying is if you were looking for the perfect example of what sort of befell us there, I, I you, you'll remember I was constantly saying to you, like, if, if we're going to win these trophies, we need Mo to be at his best. If we're going to get this thing over the line, we need Mo to be at his best. And I just can't help thinking that if, if Mo's at his best, it, we, we, we probably have a couple of goals rattled in early in that last day of the season. And then maybe there's a whole different atmosphere going on over at the Etihad when they hear what's going on there. And who knows what kind of knock-on effects that can have. And certainly in a game like the Champions League final, where it's kind of made for him, you know, <laughs> there was a lot of talk before the game about how Danny Carvajal was basically past it and how Mo would have no problem up against his direct opponent on the other flank either. And that's not what proved to be the case. And it just felt as if in him we could see sort of a lot of what you were talking about, the endeavour and effort was still there, but there was something that just qu wasn't quite at the level that it needed to be. And that's a long-winded way of saying when we start making tweaks to the team, and we can talk about what they might be in a bit, but just in, in general, when we start making tweaks to the team, what does that do? And are we ready for a new evolution? Do you actually, what's your gut feeling on this? Do you do you actually feel like we're going to be able to stand up, go at it again next season and be there or thereabouts in all these competitions come the end? Yeah, I have no worries about that. I have no worries about uh, Jürgen Klopp's back from staff's ability to uh, get the rest into the players at a very relatively short period in, in, in terms of recovery. I mean, it wasn't sort of till, till after the Champions League final and then you go, what do the players do now? And then you go, wow, you know, it's international since some of them are playing four nation league games and, and it's not finished until the 13th of June. So that in itself is not ideal. And due back on the 4th of July uh, is not ideal either. Uh, but I, I trust that they can, I trust that they can do it. So I have no doubt that when we kick off uh, 6th of August, we, we'll be ready. Absolutely no doubt. Uh, how that will pan out, second half of the season with the World Cup and everything, I have absolutely no idea. I mean, we, we saw the impact that the African Cup of Nations had on two of our star players. One, it, it rejuvenated him, and for the other player, it, it, it left some scars that, that affected the rest of his season. And so there's various things to, to play with, but there's no doubt in my mind that Klopp would know, because the season is so bizarre, that with six Champions League games before the World Cup and 16 Matt stays in the Premier League and he will know that we can't afford to come back on Boxing Day being five, six, seven points behind our nearest contender, which obviously is going to be Manchester City. And so he'll know we, we'll have to be ready. We'll have to be ready for it all because otherwise you miss out on it all. You know, and I don't believe there is that kind of thing where you go, well, all right, second half of the season, let's go. Because you can't plan for that because you've never ever experienced that before. You've never experienced that before. Normally, you'll go, well, okay, we play 38 games with everything else in there. But now, right in the middle, the players are going to be, be, be taken on. Some of them will be playing five, six, seven games, plus a few few friendlies before us. And so, it's it's not ideal. So, I don't think you can kind of rely on second half. We know what we're doing. We know what the, what, what, what the really important periods are, where the, there's loads of games over Christmas and New Year, where we're normally pretty strong. So you, can't, you can't plan for that. So, you have to make sure that when we break in November, that we're there, we're through in the Champions League, we're right, not if not ahead of Manchester City journey on their tail, isn't it? Because, as I said before, we have no idea what the second half of the season is going to bring because it's a brand new experience. A brand new experience, and there's been so many of them, not necessarily for the good, in fact, mostly for the bad in recent years. Um, 
with all the stoppages and closures and 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 and, and shutdowns and lockouts and lockdowns and all the other uh, horrendous words that we are hoping to completely eradicate from our vocabularies going forward. But this one, as you've just outlined, is going to be an absolute circus of a season. I mean, it's a real freak show of a season already, just even thinking about what it means, what it entails. We've spoken about it before, and I know you you want to lean into the idea of, look, um, let's look at the positives. It, it, it could be great and it could be exciting. It will be probably exciting regardless. Uh, and, but the challenge for the team is 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 monumental. I'm, I think I think you're so right, man. I think that's a really important point, and it's kind of you know connects very well. With what I was asking is that we are going to have to be ready to go right out the gates uh, immediately and get ourselves to that position uh, in that first half of the season where we're in everything we want to be and 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 right up there in terms of points and all the rest of it. So it is going to be a big ask, and of course, like I, I've, I've hinted around a couple of times now. There's going to be a sort of, a, if not a sea change, then quite a quite a big cosmetic change to the squad, uh, which has been very stable for a while. Obviously, we had the introduction of Diaz, and that's been one of the real highlights of the last six months. Um, um, even if we couldn't get those two big ones over the line, and it's nice for him to be part of that and to have had that. Uh, that, that that parade experience as well. I mean, holy shit, yeah, and that was something special and. I'll just get your quick take on that as well. Increasingly, um, and we saw it on, on, on our next topic, we'll, we'll be chatting about it. We saw it with rival fans when they were talking about um, the perceived ideas about Liverpool supporters abroad. There's increasing tribalism. And it's nasty, nasty old crap, to be honest, um, that's been flying around about that. But it's equally pretty, pretty uh, awful to hear some of the things you know, from, from rival fans about where we are and the status of the club. And I think it comes, I think you've said it before, it comes from a place of most of them knowing that, knowing what the club is really and knowing that they can never have anything quite like that. I think it's why, as, you, as you've as you already pointed out several times in the show before, it's why people raise their game when they come to Anfield because there is something that bit different about it. And that probably rubs clubs the wrong way. I, I think it might piss me off if I was a rival fan as well. So I do see that. But a lot of people were talking about me on the parade and kind of sneering at it. But Kloppo, I think, as ever, was very much on the money when he was talking about it. He, he actually looked as if... Uh, he looked as if he might have had a, 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 a sherry or two uh, while he was while he was explaining this. But he was basically saying, look, we didn't get a chance to talk about or to celebrate winning the freaking league, which was monumental. And it happened in that shitty lockdown, closed down season. Uh, and I didn't get a chance to celebrate because we blew the league away that year. It was a monumental achievement. And. I think it was really important for that to be marked as well. So there is, I think, the value of that. But just, I mean, do we should we have to justify when a, a club wins two cups, uh, having a celebration of that, even if that alone? It seemed a bit petty to me to be critical of it. And I'd like to get your take on what you thought it was for the players as well, um, because to me it looked very genuine. And the turnout was fucking insane, man. Yeah, I mean, we knew the turnout was going to be insane. So, but, you know, that's just just the way it is. And I, I, I don't know, but I just think that what ninety percent of clubs who win the FA Cup these days still have a parade the next day. Surely, I mean, that's that's the way I remember it. I remember in the last few years, Chelsea having a parade winning the FA Cup. Arsenal's had a parade winning the FA Cup. Uh, so, so I think that's kind of thing, still still the, the the done thing, isn't it? Uh, this is obviously because of the timing of it all. You know, and it's 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 come. If if it had been the day after the FA Cup, I think a lot of people would have probably gone, "Yeah, okay." Isn't it? But it is a bit of this. You know, what, what are they celebrating? You know, they, they were going for a quadruple now. They've only earned a bit two. But it's the same thing we're experiencing now with, with the Darwin Nunes thing or whatever. Isn't it? I mean, oh, I didn't think Liverpool spent money on on, on players. Well, you know, to improve on on what we got now ain't going to be cheap, is it? So you'll have to spend big if you want to improve, and we want to stay ahead of the the pack, isn't so. I don't read too much into it, Trevor. It, it, it is what it is, isn't it? I experience with loads of people. When you meet, you know, nice, sensible, rational supporters of other football clubs, they they generally inquire and they just go, "What is it? What is it that makes Liverpool so special?" And you kind of go, "Where do, where do you want us to start?" Isn't it? I, I said, but in the end, 
it's the relationship, the respect, you know, players and the fans amongst us, and and we support each other, isn't it? We, we we never throw anyone under the bus and whatever. We we, we just have a, a a special understanding, isn't it? I think a lot of people are deep down are jealous of that. I mean, why can't they be that? I mean, look what happened to Everton. They decided in the last six weeks of the season, do you know what? We might win a few games to support the team. So they started to support the team and they won a few games, isn't it? You know what I mean? And then and Liverpool have, have, have done that ever since I can remember, you know, back in the in the early 60s. The support team is much better than anything else, isn't it? And we do that. We don't accept anyone inside the stadium booing the team or getting on the team's back. It's not what we do. And yeah, I think a lot of people look and go, why can't we be like that? Of course, they'll never admit it. I don't think so. Uh, I'm kind of connected to that, you know, the idea of the club and the togetherness of the fans and stuff like that. I mean, we saw in the build-up to the Champions League final, it, it couldn't have been more sort of, uh, I think, positive. Uh, the signs that uh, things were going to go well and there was just a fantastic feeling. I, I know so many people who were out there and uh, you were looking at this, this, the scenes from the fan parks and it did look quite amazing and and just the sheer volume and 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 the sheer numbers of 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 reds enjoying themselves in a, in a foreign city it's become a thing we're used to now and you know the fan park situation in moscow was great the one in madrid was outstanding and it seemed to be lining up again like that and then everything went to shit of course um and in the aftermath but in the in, we know what happened, and and you'll have had been you'll have been on the sharp end of it, of course, um, because you'll have had that sort of uh, responsibility to 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 comment or report on the 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 half facts that were coming in. And I think it very much depended on who was supplying the information. I was watching on BT, and they had an awareness. And there seemed to be, I think, again, especially the Stephen Gerrard, who was on the panel, um, went out of his way to talk about, you know, reports that he was seeing about um, fans being um, uh, tear gassed and children and women being sort of roughed up and stuff like that. So there was a sort of balance to it. But basically, for the most part, mainstream media went with the UEFA version of events, which we know was hideously flawed. Uh, and basically lines. They've have issued an apology um, way too late, obviously, uh, in the last couple of days. And of course, it completely failed to uh, address the things it should have. It was fairly, uh, fairly lame effort, if we're being honest, and left an awful lot unaddressed. And today, if you turn on your Sky Sports, uh, you'll see big yellow chirons going across the bottom and it'll talk about how uh, there was an apologies from uh, the uh, Paris police prefect, a fellow called Didier L- uh, Lallemand, uh, who had apologized. And that's the big word that's coming across in yellow and black on the bottom of your screen. And then you go and you read what actually was said by this chap. And it's not an apology at all. It's uh, It's one of those well, I'm sorry if you were offended type apologies. Do you know one of those ones really half arsed and completely uh, fails to address the situation again and perpetuates bullshit about drunk fans, um, ticketless fans, uh, fake tickets, although they say, well, maybe we got our our facts wrong a little bit on that. But it was really, again, completely half arsed. Now, I'm sure like me, Jan, this brought back you know, I, I, I'm I'm lucky enough that I didn't have anyone who's deliver, uh, directly involved uh, in 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 uh, any of the real dark tragedy around Hillsborough. I know people who were there, obviously, and who are still who uh, know one person particularly who who never really got over it. But, you know, I didn't I didn't lose anybody, but uh, just as a club, the flashbacks were kind of. It was kind of hard to hard to get your 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 head around, wasn't it? I mean, you must have been feeling that as well. It was, it was a real throwback to those dark days, especially the responses from authority. Yeah, the first thing I will say, Trevor, it was extremely difficult on the night. We had uh, at the stadium, we had a we had a uh, cameraman outside with a reporter, and they were obviously the first ones to report that there might be a delay because they could see what was happening in terms of people not getting in. Mm. Uh, and then, you know, the word we're going, well, okay, can you find out what is happening? Why are people not letting in? And, you know, the first thing they come back with is some technical issues. Uh, 
the reason that people can't get in. Uh, and it wasn't until later on, even with a cameraman outside, that we could get some pictures that suggested otherwise, that suggested that there was there was some police I- 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 problems with, with the way that they, where they decided to, to sort of get the Liverpool fans to go through to get inside the stadium. All these things, isn't it? But, but what actually came across very clearly, and this was the one thing that delighted me, Trevor, because straight, straight away, I was like fuming, you know, maybe something, and here we go again, without knowing the facts. But what came back pretty clear, uh, and that's that's kind of how I finished the, the, the program when we when we went off air, it was that the fact that people were there in time. And that was the big thing for me is that, you know, people were saying, you know, people turning up late and I'm going, we can't have this. We can't have people turning up late. And that was the one thing we were getting through once our report and the cameraman got a bit more and they went, no, people were here in time. People were here in good time. You know, we're talking about between four and two and a half hours before kickoff. And I went, that's great. Because if that's the case, then you've got nothing to be ashamed of. And what then transpires after is nothing but, but shameful. Uh, did we give it enough thought, Trevor? You know, Paris being the, the replacement city for St. Petersburg? Probably not. I mean, France has got a lot of problems, uh, you know, and Paris got a lot of problems. I wouldn't go to, as far as to call it a war zone uh, because it's not quite that, but they have got a lot of problems. Uh, where the stadium is situated, uh, you know, surrounded by ring roads and motorways and there's nowhere for, 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 for people to, to, to be. Uh, and then, of course, we we got the local element uh, of the local people turning up and thinking, you know, what what, what can we get from this evening? And so so it was shambles. But I have to say, to her, I mean, you know, we have a we criticise Raven for a lot of things, and I think a lot of it is warranted. There is some things I think were maybe a bit too hard in it. But UEFA organising major football events, they just always miss the fucking point. It's remarkable how often they miss the point. They miss the reason that people travel to Paris. They travel to see a game of football and they miss that. The things that you ever think are important is not important to football fans. That is only one thing that matters to them, and that is the match. Even as far as to go, travel in the hotels, fans will find a way of dealing with that. But you ever have to put on a football match. Nothing else. People are not interested in NFL entertainment before games or whatever shit that, that UEFA are interested in. Just put the game on and make sure we can, we can all get in and, and, and have a good time. But time and time and time again. I mean, you know, I go to, I don't know, what do I do? 15 Champions League games a year, you know, all operated by UEFA. And time and time again, you go, wow. Euro 2021, you go, wow. You know, even some of the UEFA employers would go on to us, don't ask it just doesn't make any fucking sense. Nothing that they ever do make any sense, you know. And it's it's a worry uh, because because you know how powerful UEFA are, Trev, and you know the way that they muscle in. You know, when Liverpool play a home game in the Champions League, they basically arrive 48 hours before the game and go, "The stadium now belongs to us," and away they go. It's a worry that they can't fucking put on events. It, it, in fact, it's horrendous. They have no idea about security. They have no idea about anything. You know, I believe that the, the guy who's in charge, the security guy, is. is is another friend of the uh, of of the uh, of the president, isn't it? I have to say, Trevor, it's fucking shambles, and it's all very good. We talk about ownership of football clubs in England, and blah blah, and we we have to have somebody looking. We have to have somebody looking into fucking UEFA, you know, and, and and making sure it isn't just about jobs for the boys, making as much money as he can uh, by doing all these things that basically fans have no interest in. It is shambles. You know that that's so right, and and the thing about it is. And it sounds maybe old fashioned and it sounds like a bit of a platitude, but it should be. It's supposed to be about the fans and the people who are going through that game. Obviously, none of us are naive enough to think that that's all there is to it, because clearly uh, it's a revenue stream on a massive, massive scale when it comes to TV and stuff like that as well. But how much do you think those television images will have hurt the whole organization? I mean, they've looked ridiculous on the back of it no matter how hard they've tried to spin uh, and the french government have tried to spin and push the blame back onto uh, lazy stereotypes and tropes of drunken fans and ticketless fans it still looks absolutely appalling for them and you know i i just hope it kind of bites them on the arse financially because that's the only way that uh, idiots like that learn a lesson 
However, of course, uh, in the immediate aftermath, I, I, I couldn't help but sneer when I, 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 it became clear that a few people who are uh, representatives of some of the, the, high, the high-end sponsors of the, of the event had some of these problems in accessing. And, well, of course, all of a sudden now, because the VIPs had a problem getting in and they might report back to their sponsor pals and buddies and bosses, and then all of a sudden that sponsorship might not be a thing. Well, all of a sudden uh, they were all turned around on how they might approach it and lessons will have to be learned, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it just leaves a bad taste in the mouth. Yana. And again, you'll have seen all the videos maybe you didn't maybe you didn't want to watch them I, I i i had a good look around at stuff because i was pretty furious for about two days about everything but primarily that and then listening to podcasts from the lads here in ai so many of them had been over there and to listen to their experiences um they were almost uniformly had some negativity around it you know all of them to an extent or other felt that feeling of threat of being vulnerable, uh, of being sort of, as you said, almost in a war zone. Um, with all the heavy handed policing, it was a lack of policing that they felt uh, or a complete lack of empathy from those police. And, you know, it's it's such a shit show, Jan, that it makes you wonder. And when you see the cliches, the harmful cliches getting trotted out like they tried to do immediately, and, and shift the blame. They were still talking about drunken English fans today, man, even in the um, so-called apology from the police guy. I mean, that's damaging, very damaging in an ongoing way. And it shows you, doesn't it, how low on the pecking order the football fan is. Yeah, it is It is remarkable, Trevor. I mean, there's a lot of players in, sorry, there's a lot of places in Paris where you wouldn't go unless you got to, and when you got to go to a place like the stadium uh, at, at Saint Denis, you would want some kind of protection. And I and I think yet again, what I was talking about UEFA before, isn't it? That's again where they fail the crowds because outside that stadium, you need some protection, you need to look after. There wasn't any, uh, but but the one thing you talk about, UEFA obviously had access to different pictures. Than what we were shown, you know, through uh, the, the police cameras and, and 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 everything else that was going on the CCTV. So they knew a lot more than us, and they come to the same conclusion that you just did, Trevor, by saying this won't fucking look good. Yeah, it doesn't matter what way we spend, this won't look good. Yeah, with our sponsors and everything else. Let's see if we can get rid of some of this blame. Let's see if we can get rid of some of this blame. Let's throw it out there. See if somebody can stick his name because they realised. That there's going to be a comeback on this, isn't it? And there will be a comeback because no danger that I don't know how many people come from some of the big sponsors, whether that's Heineken or Mastercard or wherever they are. I don't know how many guests they send, but they send a lot of guests, you know, and it only takes a few of their big, big boys uh, to complain. And, you know, Liverpool Football Club, I mean, I said before I wasn't there, but we had the email through today and they're obviously looking for uh, some stories from some of the former players and whatever, and all these things, it's not right, but it carries, just carries that little bit more weight, isn't it? You know, if, 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 if some of the better known and people have, that, that, that have had their problems uh, experience the same problems. So we haven't heard the, the end of this. Uh, you know, I think UEFA and the French police and everybody else, the French government, will, 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 have, to, will have to get together and get this shit together and, 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 and this and just lay it out the way it is and go and listen. We made a mess of it. Uh, we would like to apologise and, and 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 clear that thing. Yeah, of course, of course, there was football fans there who had too much to drink. That's kind of how it goes, isn't it? But but if those people who had too much to drink aren't causing any problems, then you know, and it's not as if you're not you're not used to dealing with drunken people, isn't it? So it is a poor excuse. <laughs> a hundred percent, man. A hundred percent. And look, I mean the the. The upshot of the footballing side of things is that, um, you know, uh, the season is whatever the season is. Like I said, uh, sadly, I'm looking at, like I said, looking at the notes there, the title of the last show was The Dream is Alive. And <laughs> well, it kind of it kind of went up in flames at the end. You can't help but be very, very grateful uh, that we're still able to be involved at that high level. And you, you have expressed optimism that that will continue. And 
we have to look at it then through the kind of prism of what's happening around ins and outs. And so there was already a bit of a worry in advance of the Champions League final where Sadio Mane was asked to talk about his future and he, he, he made some sort of, he, he made a statement and in a kind of laughing, joking way, he said, look, I'll, I'll talk to you about that after the game. So I think most of us had a little bit of the fear then that that was going to be a real thing. And it looks like it is. Uh, so Sadio Mane leaving is quite interesting because, like you say, he was so invigorated by the um, the AFCON that literally I don't think if it, if it hadn't been for his upturn and form, I don't think we'd have been where we were at the end of the season. Let's put it that way, because he did start to carry the team, but started getting those vital goals uh, when Jota's form had fallen off and Mo's form had fallen off. So that's one massive loss. Then there are various assorted players around the squad who look like they're on their way when the contracts end in June. Um, you know, squad players like Oxlade, Chamberlain, uh, Carius. Uh, there's one other one again whose contract ends and I can't think who it is off the top of my head. Then you've got the likes of Queeving Keller who's ta- been talking about how he wants to be number one for Ireland and therefore needs to play. And listen, he's so good. You can kind of understand that. Um, which means we're going to have to do something there. Uh, you would imagine if, if that's the case, even if he is gone off and alone. Um, and then, you know, there are other saleable assets at the club, which may need to be cashed in if we're going to bring in the likes of a Darwin Nunes, who is being strongly linked with the club. So again, the rumors will continue for the duration of the summer about Mo. Um, of course they will. Although he seen, there seems to be a sort of, um, Look, pay me what I want or I'll walk away at the end of my last year of my contract, which would be the end of next season. So um, you start doing the sums on who's coming and who, who's going, and there will be quite a change. Obviously, there'll be continuity there. We, we saw the news of Jim, Jimmy Miller signing a, a year extension, which I don't think too many people saw, Jan, if we're being honest. What, what's your general feelings on the comings and goings? And we can bore down into a couple of them specifically then, and we'll have a chat about this boy Nunes uh, to wrap that up. So just in general, what's your feel on, on the, the cosmetics of the of the squad as, as we move into next season and, and throughout the summer? I think it feels about right. You know, I think if you go back 12 months, and we could have probably discussed some of the players you'll we'll leave now and then, but you kind of go, yeah, but hold on. This has been on the back of a difficult season with, 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 with COVID and with all the injuries and whatever. Now we've had an exceptional season. And still, there is players we have question marks over. And, you know, mainly I'm thinking about, obviously, Oxlade Chamberlain uh, being maybe the main one. Isn't it? You think of the season that we've had, the amount of players we've needed to play, and still there is no impact. So I think it's a good time to go. And also, I often think, Trevor, Liverpool there's a lot of things Liverpool are very good at but I think they're very look, good at looking at where's this team going to be in 12 or 24 months so in one or two years time I also think that Liverpool are maybe ahead of the curve in Liverpool. there's going to be more and more free transfers in football and it's going to be some of the biggest names in the game uh, because I think that's the kind of advice you're now getting from agents become a free agent uh, and you can pocket all the money yourself so if you, if you look at it I mean, obviously, Carriers is, is not a surprise and Divo Origi, as much as we, we talk about him as a legend and all these goals and whatever, but just not fit. It's not available for enough games to play at a play at a top club. Ben Woodburn, uh, a lot of people had high expectations for him. Never really going to happen. And then, of course, you've got the ones... Let's, one thing we need to get straight to, Trevor, this is the 9th of June, the window opens tomorrow, Friday, the 10th of June. Uh, so, so, so things will start to move. Then, Nico Williams and Fulham will be quite keen to take on their return to the Premier League, but they won't be the only ones. I think Nico Williams will be a, an excellent Premier League player, but the only way he can learn is by playing. So, it's the right thing to let him go and let him play. Uh, but I think Liverpool are expecting more clubs apart from uh, Fulham to show an interest. Nat Phillips is heading towards uh, Bournemouth or that, I have very little doubt. Uh, I'm amazed that if other clubs don't come in, because when you look at so many clubs, we find it difficult to find a centre-half who can defend. You know, everybody kind of want ball playing centre-halves, but when they realise they can't defend, they go, we could do with some defence. So, made all of the other clubs showing a bit of interest. Minamino, I think the club have made it pretty straight. Again, 12 months ago, should we keep him? Shall we? Well, well, let's have a look. He's been out on loan at Southampton. Now we know he's great, but 
he isn't what we're looking for. And I think the club has been pretty clear. Uh, 17 million is a deal. There'll be a lot of interest in him. Um, mm. So you know that because of his attitude and, and what he brings. And he's always available. You know, so he's a good player. And then, of course, uh, the, the big one is just the Sadio Mane thing. Uh, just, I just didn't know where that came from. I didn't know where the build-up to the Champions League came from. Uh, why he felt the need to say what he did, uh, but but I was like you, okay? Was he going to sign his new contract? What he would have just done that and carried on. So we knew, kind of knew where he was going. Uh, but I don't think since then, and he's gone away to play for his country. He's covered himself in glory. I don't think we'll ever be able to take away his status as a Liverpool legend because he's been absolutely fantastic. Uh, but he's made a little bit of a mess of this, and I think that's a little bit disappointing. So I hope what people are telling me now that he's decided not to say any more is probably the best is not to upset any more people and not to kind of just harm his legacy a little bit. Yeah, it's a weird one. And I think there was a, perhaps some misinterpretation of some of the things he was saying because people didn't translate stuff right. But the gist of it was still he was laughing and joking about leaving the club. And that, whether it's meant um, in a polite way or, 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 or not, is going to wind people up a bit. Obviously, you're right. And I think um, it doesn't take much um, <laughs> to get people riled up and uh, to be losing someone of his sta- a status is, 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 is a blow. So there wasn't this kind of thing that I will do what most Senegalese people want me to do. What, mm. what, what, I mean, why not ask the Liverpool fans what they want to do? Yeah, yeah, ex- exactly. And then you'd, um, you'd have to support ninety nine percent of all people who would have said sign the contract and stay. Yeah. Exactly. Sixty to seventy percent of Senegalese people want me to do. It's, it's, I can't it's, have Senegalese people want to go to Bayern Munich. I mean, what's the big deal there? I don't get it. I mean, that make, it makes very little sense. It makes very little sense. Um, why, why the good people of Senegal would would be so invested in in Sadio heading off? And it just sounded it, the whole thing sounded a bit hinky. And it just, I like you. I just, I, I, I wish it had gone a little bit more smoothly, and he could have just gone out with a little bit more dignity. But he does very much look like he's going, and that's a big, big, big loss. Uh, if you take what we saw towards the last half of the season as, you know, his role, uh, what his role would have been. Um, and the fact that uh, the man who we brought in in January looks like he's going to be re- the, nominally Sadio's replacement on that side, then we are going to have to fill that gap through the middle. And of course, the big chat at the moment is about this Darwin Nunes kid. He's got very good numbers for last season, but he also has... A history, granted, when he was a very young man, of a couple of serious injuries. I think, um, including a, you know a kneecap operation at one stage, um, and you know, it, it, obviously, there's some nerves around that. But I found myself. I think it's, it was the thing that got me back in a little bit was the excitement of this possible possible transfer. You know, at this stage that. I could not give two flying whatevers about budgets and transfer pots and uh, ledgers and balance sheets. I don't care. It's not my money. And most of the time when we're talking about this type of thing, the only things that we can say as fans is that we can be fairly sure there'll be no massive risks taken with Liverpool's capital. That's pretty much a guaranteed thing. And that there will be, uh, by comparison with our rivals, a comparative restriction on the amount of money that we can uh, spend without recouping it back. This is just the current, this is the model, and therefore that's all we know. So I don't give a shit if Darwin Nunes costs a hundred million because you know that the money men and the boffins will have worked some way of recouping that by sales. So who cares? So the the, the price tag, I, I don't give a shit about it. I would say that it's a huge amount of money and would bring with it a massive amount of expectation. Now it seemed to be more of a thing in the past, Jan, where I remember lads in the 80s um and into the 90s too but you know that would arrive places with these record fees and it was a bit hit and miss you know a lot of them did wear that 
expectation very heavily on their heads. Um, and it's going to be a big ask for a fella who's really only got one outstanding season behind him um, on the um, uh, club scene uh, and in the European scene uh, to step in and be brilliant immediately. Now, most people will say to you, well, Klopp, that's what Klopp does. Klopp works with players and makes them better, it makes them the best versions of what they can be. And if you don't believe that at this stage, you've not been watching the Liverpool. So it's for those reasons that I find myself um, excited, uh, a little bit wary, just nervous that 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 he won't be able to have the impact that that a lot of people are expecting immediately but it it does look like a really exciting sign doesn't Jan? because he's one of those guys you can hit the ball to him it sticks with him he's got good touch he's a he's a unit um and it looks like we could maybe adjust our game a little bit or it looks like he could possibly fit our game if if needs be uh, we've seen a lot of them i've seen do and in, in the um Times I've seen him, he's quite good coming from the left as well. So what's your general take on this whole thing? It seems quite real, doesn't it? It seems to be, there's an awful lot to it. The, the real reliable lads were out early uh, and fairly definitive about the fact that it looks like it's it's likely. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, the only thing, Trevor, is very unusual. It's it's very public, isn't it? Uh, mm. The Shays have been very public and that's not normally what we experience with Liverpool. And, there is a rumour that Manchester United have given a one more go. Uh, Eric Tenaga, by all accounts, have gone out to meet uh, the agents to see if they can do anything. But I think the boy said he said he wants to play Champions League, he wants to play for Liverpool. Uh, so there's a lot of things that tick the box, isn't it? You know, we, we, we talk about the profile of the player, the age, the amount of goals, and the fact that he's, he, he is not, you're, you're, he is not a world-class star already. But I think Liverpool have and a lot of people are pointing to the fact that is this a one one season wonder? Uh, but I think Liverpool have gone. This see, we've seen enough. We've seen enough of this boy to know that he can play in our front three. People say he can play all three. He obviously can, but I believe he's best centrally or left. Uh, and then the money is the problem, is it? But Liverpool are obviously viewing for the twenty-two year old that the deal at eighty-five plus is still right. Hence the reason that we pushed ahead with it. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see. He's got a good attitude, Trevor. He scores his goals. Obviously, the plan mainly is, and I always felt that this was going to be the case, that the next guy we would sign would be one who's predominant, a number nine. But if you look, Trevor, and I said before, we're talking about how's the team going to look in 12 or 24 months' time. I think there's a clear picture here already. So Sadio Mane will go now this summer. Mo Salah will be... Liverpool are very blunt with their players. They were very blunt with Emma Chan. They were very blunt with Wijnaldum. I think they were very blunt with, with Mo Salah. So Mo Salah will play the last year. He'll be, he'll be allowed to leave the club on a free. And Bobby Firmino, I think, will leave as well. Uh, so then you've got Schotter, Diaz, hopefully David Nunes. And I think, when I mentioned before about free transfers, it would not surprise me, Trevor, if Liverpool are, are going to contact say it's Nabry at, at Bayern Munich and say, listen, you've got 12 months left of your contract. Stay put and in 12 months, we'll come and pick you up. And I also believe that Liverpool are still very keen on Jared Bowen, which could be the big target next season. So I could see the start of next season, Schotter, Diaz, Nunes, Gnabry and Jared Bowen. And there's your generation uh, shift up front where in the end, you, you win your trophies. That's kind of the way I'm looking at it at the moment. So if I can see already where, where, where they're heading with all this. I like, I really like that, that idea of evolution. I think you're right. I think that's there. Um, and, and, and some version or other of that, I think is, is, is very, very interesting and highly likely because that does seem to be the situation with, with Mo as well. And, you know, like Sadio, maybe he's just got itchy feet, wants that one, um, last big payday stroke, one last challenge or a different change of scene or whatever. And, you know, you, you'd have to just stand up and clap the lad off as he went, if that's the case, and as, as we will do with Sadio Mane. The guys, those guys owe, owe us nothing in many ways, um, you'd have to say, because their contribution has been so massive. It's all about then being able to address um, what we lose when we lose them, if we lose them. But there's another area of the field 
I mean, we're comparatively well off in, in terms of defence, and we know we've got this kid coming in as well from Fulham too. Um, but we're comparatively well off in defence. Midfield, however, is a different story. And if Oxlade Chamberlain goes as a as a, um, a, a, st- a squad option, um, that does change things a little bit because then you're back to looking at, um, you know, we, the, the the links with too many were very real. I, I think, um, and the disappointment around him, you know, throwing his hat into the Real Madrid uh, ring was very real. So it's obviously a priority. And in my mind, Jan, it kind of can't be anything but a priority because we got to the end of the season there and we've got a situation where Jordan Henderson, there's, there's a real chance that Jordan may continue to just feature all the time. Um, or there's a chance that he may become a bit par player. And we don't know what's going to happen there. It's hard to tell. I, it's hard to tell from even the decisions that Kloppo has made. So I just wonder if other players had been really performing at their highest, um, what the team would have looked like towards the end of the season. So I don't know. I don't know what goes on there with, with, with Jordan. Um, James Miller signed a contract. And it was really interesting to hear Klopp talking about his playing ability and how that was what it was all about. Uh, he was saying like, don't don't waffle on about James's leadership skill and influence. He says, of course, that's correct and justified, but nobody should over, overlook his quality on the pitch where he continues to perform at a level that meant we simply couldn't afford to lose him. His professionalism is the benchmark for any athlete and on and on and on. He goes on about how uh, Milner only got stronger and more influential as the season went on. Now, whether or not you agree with that, that's what Jurgen appears to think. And the club appears to back him by offering James a one year extension. Tiago is outrageously good, but can be brittle in terms of availability and injuries. And Nabi Keita is quite a mixed bag in terms of of um, both of those things as well. So to me, the midfield is the one area that's screaming out for youthful energy uh, and creativity. And that's what we're supposed to be getting with too many. So I don't see how the season or how the summer can go past without us addressing that. However, I've said that in the past when we needed a defender, we didn't get one. I've said it in the past when we needed a striker, we didn't freaking get one. Um, so I, I'm not confident. What Are you hearing anything around the midfield situation? I'm hearing that they feel that they might need somebody. Uh, but I'm not hearing who they're thinking. I mean... You can obviously rank our midfield players in there. So you go, Fabinho is probably our most important. And then Thiago is number two. And Henders is number three. And then maybe Keita four. But you've still got the likes of Harvey Elliott and Curtis Jones and, and, and James Milner. And I don't know whether Klopp just thinks I'll be able to get away with what What I require from midfield players, I'll be able to get away with it. And then wait for that midfield player. You know, maybe they can't find that midfield player that they want. I, I, I don't know, but I am hearing that they could feel it is a priority. Uh, but there's no names being put to anything. Uh, I mean, you, you spoke before about the money and whatever. I mean, the 68 million by all accounts we've got to pay for, 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 for Nunes up front, that'll soon be raised by Nico Williams and Phillips and and, and uh, if Mane goes and, and then also the money from Minamino. So nothing to worry about there. So, so, so there should be money for for more purchases, whether that's whether they got the appetite for that, I I, I just don't know, and I don't know how club we use Harvey Elliott and Curtis Jones, and we have got the boy Cavalio from 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 Fulham. What is his plans there? You would think that the plan is not to play him in one of the front three positions, so more of a, a, a number eight in midfield. And so it, it is interesting, but I've got a feeling that club might just think, you know what, we might just get away with that for one more year. I might slightly disagree, but. No, listen, I, I, that's exactly where that's I fear that that's the situation. If I'm being honest, I fear that that's the situation, that that might be what they're thinking. And it's just, OK, we had the guy. Here's the guy we wanted. Um, we all were you no know, Liverpool are famous for having backup guys who end up being, <laughs> you know, uh, absolute superstars for us. So maybe that can still happen. I know there. Eve Basuma has been mentioned quite a bit as well, had been before. Maybe that's one of those things that's rumbling away in the background. Who knows? But yeah, like you, I, I'm not seeing any real tangible links um, and they're uh, outside of just vague rumours and, and obviously made up stories. So I, I, I do have the fear that that, that that might be a situation where uh, we try to lurch on. And it's not, I don't want to denigrate 
Harvey Elliott or Curtis Jones. I'm not, I'm not, that's all I'm trying to do. I'm just saying it was patently obvious that there were four lads that he was rotating between in the massive games. And of those four lads, there are issues there uh, with at least two of them um, in terms of availability and probably three. And so for me, it's a little bit dangerous. That's all I would say. It seems to me to be a little bit dangerous to not invest in that particular area with someone who's uh, young, bulletproof and and, and, and and energetic. But, you know, who knows? We, we, this is going to be a long, long, long uh, closed season and we'll have plenty of opportunities to discuss things like that. Uh, but we're kind of getting up on towards the end of the show here and I have to say, it's a, 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 I've, I've enjoyed getting back into it with you. Uh, it looks as if there's going to be plenty for us to talk about. Um, it looks as if, like you say, when the transfer window opens, we probably won't hang about. It. This thing will either get done or it won't. That's the kind of feeling you'd have about it. So there'll be lots and lots for us to be, to be chatting about on next week's show as well. And, you know, to keep people sort of in the loop uh, but with Liverpool news is one thing. But, you know, there's also plenty of bigger issue football stuff going on as well. So hopefully we'll have uh, plenty of topics to keep people entertained. And occasionally uh, we can always do our little throwback conversations about stuff that has happened in the past. I know, I know that the listeners have endless amounts of questions they'd like to put to you so that's always a good um uh runner for a show as well but you know like i said we this is a, this is a good one back uh and we should start wrapping it up uh have you plans uh, my friend for the summer in terms of 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 you know just maybe getting away from the football have you any sort of uh, nice uh, nice things lined up to 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 to, to mark the summer uh kind of i mean as I briefly mentioned before, I went on a stack weekend and my daughter's getting married in July, so you can imagine the amount of time that takes up. But once that out's away, we'll, we'll, we'll have a little holiday and then uh, she'll be back in action for the, uh, what is it, the 31st of July, is it, at uh, the King Power Stadium in Leicester uh, when we kick off the community sale. So, uh, yeah, it's plenty of time, isn't it? It's a nice sort of eight weeks stuff, isn't it? A little bit of this, a little bit of that. We're actually in Ireland. We're actually in uh, Northern Ireland on Saturday with the Liverpool Legends trip at New City. Ah, very nice, very nice. Uh, I'm and, the manager, so uh, should you pick up a defeat somewhere, Trevor? Don't blame the fucking manager. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tremendous! I look forward to hearing that. I'm, I'm, I'm actually I'm going to take this very seriously and 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 and, and, and quiz you up about this now. Next next week, uh, we will get a, a breakdown of who was good and who was shite, uh, and uh, whether you made the right calls or not. I'm looking forward to this already. I'm going to try and get an independent report as well. So I can you much, Trevor. <laughs> Yeah. Well, meanwhile, the good news is that uh, I was just flicking through Netflix there and it looks like there's a new series of Borgen coming up. So a nice bit of Sidzy to keep us happy as well. A bit of Danish. I can't wait. <laughs> yeah, it's tremendous. So it's all good. It's all good, my friend. We will wrap it up there for this week with, as usual, uh, very, very big thanks to you for going around the houses and the topics with me uh, as ever. Very enjoyable. So thanks for that, man. No problems, and to all the listeners, uh, enjoy your summer. I mean, I think we're all in the same boat, aren't we? You know, we're disappointed, but it's it, it, it's one of them, isn't it? Like a greyhound, and you're snapping away. You you sixth of August, bring on the sixth of August, isn't it? 100%. Snapping away is a good way to describe it. I think we're all getting back over the annoyance and, and looking forward and there's nothing like a, c- a signing or two to, to get people excited. So we will be with you for all of that, folks. Thanks for your support and your ears over the course of the season just past. Stick with us over the um, off season where myself and Jan will get into all sorts of topics and get geared up for the season to come. So I've been Trev Downey. That was Jan Mulby. This is Anfield Index Pro. Guy Drinkle is producing and we'll be back with you next week. We hope you enjoyed listening to this Anfield Index show. Please be sure to subscribe to our channel so future podcasts find their way to your device automatically. There's nothing quite like fan engagement and we'd love to know what you think of anything discussed on this show. The best way to get in touch is over on our free Discord community, where both podcasters and listeners debate the hottest LFC topics 24-7. Sign up free now at anfieldindex.com forward slash discord. You won't regret it. You can also follow us on Twitter at Anfield Index and find us on Facebook by searching for Anfield Index. Oh, and before you go, 
we'd love it if you could leave us a five-star review on your favourite podcast app. It only takes a couple of seconds, and it means the world to the people who create these free shows.